maybe my regret is is that I uh, s- maybe stayed too long in playing in a band like Sonic Youth. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to episode 89 of the podcast, which is going out at a very strange time in the history of the world. Maybe you're listening to this in the future, maybe far in the future, and everything's back to normal. I certainly hope that's the case. But right now, we are in the middle of the um, coronavirus pandemic. It's actually quite early days here in London. We've probably been in isolation, self-isolation for about five days so um yeah wishful thinking saying that we're in the middle of it but wherever you are i hope you're dealing with the weirdness of the situation and i hope you're keeping safe and busy and um not going crazy yet um this podcast is one that we recorded maybe a month ago or something like that i mean coronavirus was was very much the talk of the day back then We recorded this the morning that South by Southwest decided to cancel. That's where the conversation picks up. Obviously, since then, in terms of the music industry, everything has canceled. All festivals are on hold for now. Um, So, yeah, it just feels it feels strange to listen back to this time capsule from a time not too long ago when we were speculating what might or might not happen due to this crisis. So I don't have any answers, obviously. I am extremely excited that we have Kim Gordon on the podcast, though. I mean, it doesn't get much bigger or better um, than that for us. Um, I mean, you know, ridiculous. I was a bit nervous meeting Kim. She's insanely cool and uh, extremely smart and we pick up in this conversation we kind of it's a bit of a whistle stop tour of loads of the different things that she has done throughout her life and it's everything essentially from visual art she's recently been uh, the week that i spoke to her she had been campaigning for um, bernie sanders in the u.s primaries in california She's done some acting, she's done some dance, she's uh, obviously changed the face of modern post-punk with Sonic Youth, and she's released a solo album last year called No Home Record. She's written an autobiography. We touch on all of these sorts of things. I'm sure you, you know you know maybe all of them, maybe some of them. I've put some links below this episode. The guy that we that Kim talks about who was married to Jane Jane Fonda, I believe was Thomas Emmett Hayden and um, that's pretty much all you need to know going into this thank you for downloading stay safe out there and in terms of what you can do to support this podcast and loud and quiet because I'll be totally honest with you we have no idea just how fucked we are right now Um, but we are working on it and we're seeing a way to continue but we have created a donations button on our subscription page on loudandquiet.com as we always say you are more than welcome to subscribe to the magazine but right now if you if there's just a nominal small amount that you can pay us um, that doesn't cost as much as a subscription everyone's feeling it right now and we fully appreciate that so you know we don't really want to be asking for your money but some people have been in touch and said can we bung you a few quid and you can do that now at loudandquiet.com forward slash subscribe put in any amount it doesn't matter what it is most importantly though just tell a friend about this podcast this is number 89 we're approaching 100 we've had some really great people on and we just want as many people to hear as possible so especially right now when people are twiddling their thumbs a bit just tell someone that you like this podcast if indeed you do and hopefully you'll like this episode myself Stuart Stubbs talking to Kim Gordon thanks for doing this oh yeah you um how, how was your flight in yesterday? Oh, it was fine. I, I didn't know what to expect on the airplane, like if everyone was going to be wearing masks or... <laughs> how were it was they? Great. Look, see, no, not okay. really. It was good. I saw like a couple masks in the airport, but not not really. It feels like this week here, I don't know what it's been like in the States, but here we've kind of gone to a new level with it, with the whole corona thing. Mm-hmm. Is it what, What's it like in the States right now? Well, I think... Um, kind of um it's getting rough because well for one thing trump is terrible (laughs) you know like his whole rollout of it it's like 
he's it always wants to make everything about himself. Right. You know, which isn't constructive when it's a potential pandemic, <laughs> global yeah. pandemic. Um, and so, and he lies pretty much everything that comes out of his mouth is a lie. So you tend to want to assume the opposite sure. of whatever he says. And um, it's, this is, you know, it's kind of like, um, you know, I saw that um, mini, that series, uh, Chernobyl, you know, and <laughs> it kind of reminds me of, it was very timely. It reminds me of um, kind of the potential with Trump um, because he just wants to c- make himself look good all the time. Mm. And the fact that actually there aren't enough testing kits and things like that, or, you know, it's, it's, it's like, he just really says things like, well, we've had a really good smooth rollout. Like that's what he has. <laughs> right. Mostly like his message. He wants it to be. And I understand he's trying to calm the markets, but I think if he talked to, you know, if he, if they had did a better job of preparing, um, knowing what was coming, you know, that would have been more calming than. <laughs> so his kind of party line is everything's fine. That's the, that's his approach yeah. to it. Right. Yeah. Well, how about like on a, just on a street level and cause you're in LA, right? Uh huh. What's the general kind of, I mean, it's pretty, um, you know, aside from the fact that, um, people are stocking up on food and, and um, you can't find um, hand sanitizer yeah, anymore we just and things that. like this, that. This week that's happened here. Yeah. And sanitizer is like worth its yeah. weight. I know. Gold. I noticed I went to look. Uh, I was curious. I went in a drugstore last night, the super drug, and yeah, there was, everything was gone. Yeah. Um, yeah. Aside from that, it it's, doesn't seem, I mean, South by Southwest was canceled yeah. yesterday. Yeah. That's crazy. I'm sort of curious what's going to happen with other festivals. Like maybe I won't be touring mm. <laughs> this summer. You know. Yeah. It feels like we're kind of in this real state of limbo now, doesn't it? With South by Southwest canceling yesterday, it right. does feel like well, how long is this going to go on? And does that, is that going to be a domino effect now, mm-hmm. especially for things happening in the very near future? Yeah. Are you like personally, are you, are you worried? Are you particularly worried yourself? I mean, in terms of just uh-huh. the, I'm worried, it. sure. I mean, mm. yeah. Um, I mean, I'm worried, but if I'm not traveling, I'll just go in my studio and make art. So I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, I have other things I can do. Um, but no, I'm worried for the world. I'm totally worried. Yeah. Uh, you know, for all the homeless people in Los Angeles um, and the immigrants who are, you know, stuck in cages at the border and, you know, all the poor people in the world are going to suffer the most. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Not to be incredibly grim about the whole <laughs> thing, but that's the truth of it. Yeah, no, it is. On a, on a happier note, I wanted to talk to you about your Bernie canvassing, mm-hmm. um, which seems to have paid off. So, um, has, it been a, has it been called that he's won California now? Well, I mean, I think they're still counting to right. see how many delegates. Um, but yeah, I, that's kind of the one bright spot. Or, you know, like he... Um, it, it's, it's just, it's so strange because, um, the way the mainstream media works, uh, the democratic establishment, it's kind of like, uh, <laughs> if you really want to dig into it, um, you know, Biden got that one endorsement and it really, uh, just completely changed his momentum and the the media establishment were just waiting for something like that because they really dislike Bernie Sanders because if Sanders wins, they will lose their power in terms of being able to control the message and as kind of like moderate um, propo- you know proponents of moderacy and normal status quo, um, they'd be kind of at a loss mm. and so. But the fact is, is that Joe Biden is kind of feeble (laughs) and it's, that is very scary Mm. that they've chosen this. For one thing, they've chosen a candidate that's not as smart as Hillary and they're trying to run that same program and they don't understand why Trump won to begin with. They don't understand that. Yes. Even though Obama was a lovely person, he did nothing to, um, you know, the trade deals weren't good for workers in America. And he was the one who started, um, 
deporting immigrants. And I mean, you know, he was kind of more or less carrying on the status quo when he, we thought there would be change, but there wasn't. Mm. He's just like a lovely person with a lovely family (laughs) and a decent human being. But um, he didn't really change, do much to change the last 30 years of uh, democratic policies that haven't helped, um, you know, the middle class on down, really. And especially people, you know, living in poverty, honestly. Um, So, you know, the fact that Trump proposed himself as a fake populist, he... He fooled a lot of people, <laughs> basically, um, but there were real problems there. That So the Democrat establishment hasn't really taken the time to analyze really why he got elected. You're campaigning for Bernie for, for, mm-hmm. the, for the votes in California. You've been properly canvassing, right? You've been knocking on doors. Yeah. I mean, I'm guessing in California, you don't come across many... Republicans. That's that's how it seems over mm-hmm. this side of, right. the, of, of the Atlantic. But is that true? I, I mean, my presumption would be you're you're asking people who are voting for, and that you're trying to convince them n- not Biden, more Bernie. Are you hit knocking on any doors, and you're finding some diehard Republicans? Well, the thing is, the canvassing that I did and the phone banking um, that I did, um, it was mostly with people who were they were Democrats who um, it was trying to like. Or independence, you know, and if, like, they were very organized and basically you'd go out with an app that would tell you um, who ha- who was doing a mail-in vote. If they were doing a mail-in vote, you had to, like, ask if they weren't declared, which means usually meant they were an independent. They had to know that they had to get a democratic ballot in order to vote so it's like doing things like that and then okay. you mark it down on your app yeah and you know we were going to uh, mostly um uh neighborhoods with a lot of hispanics um and you know people some people who'd never voted before and so sometimes you'd have someone who was leaning or they didn't know and you could convince them but mm. for the most part we weren't really getting any Republicans. It was pretty much all going to Democratic doors. And, sure. and um, yeah. I love to imagine how I would feel if I opened my daughter canvasser and it was you, mm-hmm. if it was Kim Gordon, who I n- mm-hmm. know and recognize mm-hmm. and know the music of. Um, did you have anyone like that? Was anybody There like- might have been a couple of people like that. <laughs> oh, there was a guy who was, um, managed an um, apartment building who let us in. You know, it was a locked you know, right. gate. So, um, and I think he might have recognized me, but I always remember my mom said when Jane Fonda was married to, um, uh, God, what was his name? He was a politician and they were living in Venice like hippies. And, okay. Uh, right. But anyway, she, uh, she said Jane Fonda came to the door. <laughs> That's <kind of laughs> room. It was funny. <laughs> yeah. But mostly, I mean, we're going to like kind of lower middle class Hispanic neighborhoods. Okay, sure. Were you always politically active? Like, can you remember, like, when did you get into, like, actively interested in politics? Was it a super young age? I mean, you know, because I am old. (laughs) I did go to a lot of, um, you know, demonstrations, you know, as a teenager in the 60s, uh, the late 60s, you know, in 1970. I remember we had a teacher's strike at my high school and we didn't go to school for like a semester. We were supporting the teachers and nice. marching around the outside of the school. And that was very exciting, yeah. actually. And the feeling of what it meant to be part of a movement. And I have always been, you know, interested in politics. I mean, but I always thought as a musician, um, if you're, you know, it's hard to do both, you know, and... Um, because Sonic Youth was not a conventional band, I guess I always felt like um, anything you do that's that is work that's against the uh, homogenized culture that you, one lives in mm. <laughs> is some kind of a political um, action. Right. Um, but now I feel like it's you know really time for action. <laughs> mm. I mean, I I've been you know ever since Trump got elected too. It's just been 
you know, it's so hard to ignore the political landscape and I've become pretty obsessed with it. And, yeah. and I've always been like a little skeptical of people in the public who have gotten involved with politics or, but in a way I kind of see how you would want to it and it does give your life a little more meaning in yeah. a certain way. I really liked the video that went online. I'm guessing it was on Tuesday uh-huh. of you baking the cake. Oh yeah. <laughs> that was cool. Yeah, it was sort of a reference to this Martha Rossler um, kind of uh, video she made. Right, okay, yeah. This artist, yeah. I saw it everywhere. It definitely got out there. Oh, that's definitely good. Definitely worked. Yeah, it was a kind of a so simple and lo-fi and kind of uh, fun. Yeah, it looked really great. But, I mean, originally, like, because so, you grew up in it, like, I think a lot of people mm-hmm. maybe didn't re- really realize this until your book came out. Until right. Until Girl in the Band came out because of the New York thing and everyone sure. just, you know, something you were such a part of New York in the eighties and nineties that they didn't realize that you actually grew up in LA and you're back in LA now. Yeah. And you wanted to be a dancer, right? Is that right? Or, I or, mean, or yeah, point. that was part of my, I mean, I always wanted to be a visual artist, quite right. frankly, but I did take Martha Graham. Um, and I did want to be a dancer. I liked my mom kind of just, even though she was the one who found the class and everything, she discouraged it. She just said it's a really hard life. Um, but it, mostly I just wanted to be a visual artist. How about like now, if you're at a wedding, and the tune, are you the first on the dance floor at a wedding? Oh, God, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, you know, I have done this uh, dance. I've done a few sort of conceptual dance pieces, performances, um, and I've worked a few times with this uh really great choreographer dancer called Dimitri Chamblay. We do this thing that revolves around contact improvisation. I don't know if you know this no. Steve Paxton started it and kind of comes out of the sort of Fluxus Judson church dance group okay. in the seventies. Basically it's using gravity and kind of each other's bodies and but I've introduced so we do that, but I have my guitar also that I that kind of enters into it with sounds and, but we, we did, we did this performance at the Louvre last fall. I think it was last, doing Fiat. That right. was pretty amazing just to be, do it in that place. We've done it a few times. Yeah. And he's super interesting. He started a dance program in this maximum security prison in um, Lancaster, working with these super macho guys. <laughs> okay. It's incredible. Wow. I saw, his wife, who's a documentary filmmaker, sent me a teaser of what she shot of it. It's amazing. It, um, like hearing you talk about that, it just amazes me the amount that you do and the amount of different mediums that you've worked in throughout throughout mm. your career and stuff. Um, and it just makes me think, like, how do you have the time? One, one, how do you have the time yeah. to do all this stuff? But um, th- I suppose the thing that connects everything from your visual art to your music to sonic youth your solo stuff even like your writing your essays and things is this kind of thread of it being unconventional within each of those things um is there anything you love or do that you consider or or maybe we would consider like conventional what is the most conventional thing that (laughs) that kim gordon likes um well Maybe just this new band, I suppose. Okay. <laughs> like to go back and have a band where you rehearse and write, you know, their songs. And yeah. Then you go out and perform. And yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Um, because with Body Head, it was me and Bill mm-hmm. improvising, even though it felt like a band. And it is a band. Um, I mean, that's, I guess, conventional and dealing with music press and, and interviews and promoting. Um, I suppose that's pretty conventional. The, I mean, the new record that came out last year, No Home Record, because that was your first solo record that you've done mm. in 38 years, which seemed to be mm. the narrative that a lot of people picked up on. Was it as big a deal for you as it was, as it seemed to be for everyone else that Kim Gordon suddenly made this solo album all these years in? Mm. It, it wasn't a big deal at the time when I was making it. I didn't really think about it. Um, and um, yeah, it was only when... Yeah, I started doing interviews or that people wanted to do, that the record company wanted to promote it so much. Um, And I mean, my, you know, when I put the book out, that was kind of, I felt like my first time other than 
having various solo art shows, you know, but not on the same scale as like, oh, I didn't realize like what a big deal books were to people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of, um, you found that everybody wanted to know about, they were like hungry for this stuff. They were yeah. like, we really want to know what Kim's yeah. life's been like. Yeah. Was that like a surprise? To yeah, them? totally. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I went to a school, this lab school at UCLA, which was all really learn by doing. And so it kind of was this cross contextual learning situation very early on before people really talked about that in education. So it's kind of, um, in a way, my natural instinct to work in different mediums. Although I do always did kind of see myself foremost as a visual thinker, visual artist, or whatever. Yeah. Is there any mediums that you either haven't done or you've not done, you feel you've not done enough of, enough of? Um, well, I'd like, I guess I'd like to work in film or with film and, and, um, I did actually this film as an art project uh, that Dimitri's wife shot, actually, she's a director, with me, with my guitar downtown, walking around um, downtown LA, basically using corporate buildings as a guitar slide, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, and logos, and things like, I had a little amp, and I just, um, and I had a show that opened in New York um, that was up a couple months ago or a month ago, and that was an installation that was part of it. And um, I, I would like to do, you know, more things with film in art, but also in a like a some kind of feature yeah. way. Yeah, I didn't realize until um, yesterday. I was reading up on you a little bit here and there, and I didn't realize that you had a fashion label as well back in the early 90s. Yeah, X-Girl. X-Girl, yeah. yeah. How, was, uh, how was that, being like in that, that fashion world? Well, you know, my friend Daisy Von Firth, um, who's the sister of Julie Kafer, it's from Pussy Galore, we, um, you know, we knew the X-Large boys through the Beastie Boys. Sure. And um, they would... You know, one of them here, Daisy and I, discussing buying uh, bootcut <laughs> Levi cords in the 70s and finding the right t shirt that fit and stuff like that. And uh, there wasn't a lot going on in the street wise in the fashion world in downtown New York then in the early 90s. Um, so they asked us if we wanted to do a girls' line. Uh, um, we, ne we never really considered ourselves designers, really. <laughs> um, and they, it was, so we did that for um, a couple years and then sold it to Japanese, basically. Okay. Which I, I made more money doing that than I ever made. Yeah, yeah. Being a, playing in a band. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, sure, yeah. That's the perfect business mo mo that's the That's the model, isn't it? Build it up sell it quick yeah people i think don't make money till they sell it but you know it was also a good lesson in what happens when you sell your brand name because what they do in japan it's we thought it would die off but it's still going and oh, it's still it's there nothing like what we did at all or our idea it's okay. just but the name x girl really registered with people and mike mills uh was a actually a big factor in its success <laughs> because he made uh you know we he designed uh the t-shirts like the right. graphics and okay. uh you know we talked to him about what we wanted but um and you know we'd reference like uh Françoise Hardy or uh, Anita Pallenberg um you know um but the clothes never really <laughs> came out to fit the way we <laughs> wanted them to because X Large didn't know anything about making girls clothes and we would send samples back and forth and then to get it to fit right and then it would just come out as something different yeah we were, were constantly <laughs> being like harassed things were too small and or too big uh, you know and, and um you know we didn't have there wasn't a big budget for production and right. this fashion industry is super frustrating yeah yeah but you've you've done have you have you been involved in that a little bit the fashion industry away from a little that, bit yeah, i mean i've done like small here. collabs but nothing you know that was kind of interesting like for some reason at that time it had such an impact um it was also when like streetwear like for dudes was also like 
super baggy clothes, you know, and, um, you know, we were trying to do something more fitted and, you know, something that would appear to, you know, that would appeal to and look good on different body shapes and mm. things like that. I mean, now, like, there's so much street, you know, streetwear is now high fashion. Thing, and, yeah. you know, it's all like totally bananas. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> One of the mediums that you've done a bit of, and I just wanted to ask if you enjoyed, was like the acting. You were in Girls and um, was it I'm Not There? I was in I'm Not There and um, um, Olivia Assayas is a French director. Yeah. His film Boarding Gate and I've been in a couple Gus Van Sant movies. And then you've been in a few things that just playing yourself as well. Yeah, the, those are the little hardest. Camp, little, yeah, yeah, I was going to yeah. say, what's that like? Because you're... I was going to actually ask if that's the easiest thing, if uh, you just have to turn up on set and be you, uh, but that's harder. I don't know. Well, we did Gossip Girl. I think that was the only time. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. I mean, that was, I don't know. It just felt really ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, and honestly, like we only did it because my daughter watched the show. Sure. And, okay. Yeah. Um, but, uh, oh, and there was Gilmore Girls too. A lot that of shows it. with the yeah. name Girls in it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, but, um, I don't know. Like I, I find, um, you know, I've, I'm a little tired of doing cameos. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to do that anymore, but I would like to, uh, to me, it's all of a spatial experience in mm. a way. And acting to me is moving through space and <laughs> it's psychological stuff, which I, I like. Yesterday, I also listened back to your uh, podcast with Mark Maron on the WTF oh, yeah. from a couple of years back, I think when the book mm -hmm. came out. And um, it reminded me on there, there's, you mentioned on there that you, growing up, you used to be an easy crier. You'd cry a, mm -hmm. cry a lot when yeah, you were like true. younger. It, <laughs> how's, uh, is that something that's, that's still around? I'm still like that. Yeah. Are you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I feel I'm getting more of a crier as I get older. Mm -hmm. I think I was quite together through my 20s yeah. and teens. And now it doesn't take much to make me want to cry. Yeah. Yeah. Is it for you? What um, what sets you off? Is it films, music, anything? Honestly, in like it can be a question. You know, like <laughs> I just did this fifty question thing with the Guardian. Right. You know, and I was like, uh, well, you want me to tell you what my biggest regret is, or oh, you know wow. what I mean? Like okay, there are like there. some heavy questions, which I, a lot of the really personal ones, I kind of blew off. Yeah, but batted away. Yeah, sure. Like, um, I am pretty susceptible in a certain way to a cry <laughs> to, yeah. to influences how about f uh, films I, i'm i'm not a crier at films weirdly uh -huh. unless they're um like documentaries or real life uh -huh. things yeah no i i definitely can be i mean honestly yeah i can be even though i'm mad that it's making me cry yeah. or something i you, hate you the know emotional it's, you know ma it's manipulation foolish, yeah <laughs> have you seen any re good films recently what did you watch on the plane coming here oh god i watched um what is it? F Ferrari versus Ford. Or oh, yeah. Ford versus Ferrari. Yeah, we I, have a different name for that here. Okay, I actually liked it. Um, I mean, seeing it on a small screen is the worst. It's not great, yeah. Um, yeah, I had low expectations, but um, I mean, I love um, both those actors. Christian Bale's yeah. amazing. And, um, I don't did I cry? <laughs> it's worse when you're at altitude, I think, as yeah. well. You're more susceptible to I it, I think right? I didn't quite cry. Okay, good. <laughs> the um, the yeah, that film's got a different name. We've got a different name here for it. So okay. when it was winning the Oscars, I watched mm -hmm. the Oscars, and they kept saying Ford versus Ferrari. And I was right. thinking, is this the same film as I can't remember mm. what we called it? Oh, Le Mans. I think it's called oh, Le Mans. Okay, here. yeah. Um, have you seen Parasite yet? Yes, that, film. that was amazing. Yeah, yeah, it's incredible, right? Yeah, I um, I'd like to see his other films, which I hear are kind of more bleak. I've seen um. Is it the host or yes, the host and there's one called Mother. I think. But there are these revenge ones are supposed to be amazing. Yeah, revenge series. Yeah, I thought Parasite was just. Yeah, I didn't know it. Did you know anything about it going into it? You, I did. You I knew. knew the premise, I, right? I knew a little bit. Well, I just knew that it was um, a film about class. Right. Um. That's about it. Yeah. Really. I knew nothing of it, and I saw it in the cinema, and then it just. For anyone listening to this, says, oh, I won't ruin it, but um, it just goes in a way that I just did not expect it to go. Yeah. You know, like the way it escalates. Oh, yeah. It was amazing. I was yeah. Like, what? You know, there's certain moments in that yeah, film that, where that he achieved this certain tone was incredible. Yeah. yeah. It just looks so unbelievably beautiful. Yeah. Um, and incredible. Yeah. Um, Have you seen that um, 
documentary series called Cheer. It's on Netflix. I, you know what? I have because my wife I think watched I the cried whole thing. watching that. Did you? <laughs> At the end. Or um, my wife is a really big fan of that. Yeah. So I would um, see some of it. I've seen some of it. It's a, But I didn't realize... Um, so if anyone listening that hasn't seen Cheer, it's a Netflix, it's on Netflix, right? yeah. it's a Netflix show. Um, it's a documentary about a cheerleader squad in Texas, right? Right. But they're not... It's like they're gymna- gymnasts. They're gymnasts. Yeah, it's yeah. almost like I had no idea. My idea of cheerleading was not that. Or, no, I yeah. thought it was like that you see on like NFL or at basketball games. Yeah. But actually real cheerleaders have to retire at the age of like 15 or something. Like uh-huh. really early, don't they? In that show, I mean, there is none. They go through a col. This is a college program, right? Okay. Community college, and yeah, there isn't anything after that, it's, really. Yeah. I guess unless they become Olympic gymnasts or something. Yeah. I don't know. It's kind of brutal that they train. Yeah, and they train them so hard. They're so like, hard. They're like be, they're like breaking, spraining ankles and yeah. breaking noses and falling off pyramids. Yeah, that show is really quite fascinating. Yeah. like world. Totally. I mean, I was watching it while I was rehearsing with this new band that I just never played with before and pretty nervous about the whole thing. And I was like, if they can do that pyramid, I can do this. <laughs> yeah, it's great inspirational TV. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then they get to the end of their college career and they're just, that's yeah, it. You've that's got it. Just go and do something else with your life. Yeah, and a lot of them came from just these really screwed up backgrounds yeah. that yeah they kind of it it saved them and yeah galvanized their life in a certain way yeah it's nuts i suppose this fits in actually with um you know everybody thinking how wild it is that you've just made a solo album is it right that you first picked up an instrument when you were like 27 um right? yeah <laughs> that's true which i mean I, I was in a band i was in this sort of garage noise band in high in um college briefly right but you know that was kind of a just for an art class <laughs> sure yeah it's um i think that's quite that's really inspirational to hear that because it feels like 27 in the music industry 27 mm-hmm. is considered quite old yeah. and yet that's kind of how old patty smith and debbie harry were when they started right yeah you know it's just i think um people's focus on age became younger and younger and mm. but i honestly still don't think of myself as a musician you know i never learned to play conventionally and and i you know i I sort of picked it up in the spirit of um post-punk you know right do it yourself in that downtown um music scene of being inspired by no wave and which were mostly bands started by artists and you know it was completely expressionistic and not conventional did you have you had to kind of almost try to not learn convention that's my technique yeah yeah (laughs) (laughs) it is a technique certainly uh not getting too good or polished yeah you know there's those stories of malcolm mclaren when he formed the sex pistols getting angry at them for like practicing too much right because they wanted to get better and he was like you're missing the point yeah why would you want to be good right right that's not the point of this um we actually had uh, viv albertine on the on the podcast uh, last year and she was she told me how she wouldn't necessarily choose the life that she's had if she could go back Mm -hmm. and she certainly would discourage her daughter from doing what she's done Mm -hmm. and the point that she made was that it's so exhausting being a punk and Mm -hmm. being creative in the way that she's been creative throughout her life Um, she said it's exhausting it's a really uncomfortable was the word that she Mm -hmm. used do you, does that resonate with you in any way? Like just that, that um, idea of be operating outside of the mainstream to such an extent and being continually creative? I mean, not really, because I basically wanted to be an artist, which is sort of the same thing. Mm. Um, I think it's, um, you know, my mother said to me once, like, she didn't give me much advice at all, but she said, um, you should learn a technique. <laughs> which I'm not sure I did. <laughs> yeah. But I understand that. I like to have something that, because there's something about being in the public that, um, you know, it's fame is weird and, and the way people appreciate what you do and <clears throat> it can make you feel like an imposter because the value system is so askew and, you know, like how do you, 
equate the worth of what you do. You know, it's not like being a plumber where you can do really good work and see it, yeah. you know. Um, but <laughs> I have learned something about performance, I think. And um, so that's a weird thing to say. That's a technique, but it's... And it's also, it, within that, it's like not being too polished or, you know. Yeah. <laughs> For me, like, that's what I relate to. Like, a, um, but I, you know, I appreciate other people who are really good at it. Um, but I don't s relate to it myself. It is uncomfortable. Um, it's uncomfortable not knowing how you're going to get your next s set of dollar bills <laughs> or mm. you know whatever uh it's kind of you know financially unstable and but I, I i think um you know and maybe my regret is is that i uh s maybe stayed too long in playing in a band like sonic youth and i only did because continued to like the music and want to support it but you know, and it's, it becomes a machine that's hard to get out of. Um, so basically I took the breakup of the marriage to, to do that. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I always felt like I owed it to myself to um, really go back. And even though I had tried to maintain my pulse in art and, and do things when I could, I owed it to myself to really... Uh, you know, focus on that more. Hmm. Is there anything that you can imagine you would have done if it wasn't a life of art? What What else would you, what would you have done if you weren't doing this? You mean not working in film or anything else? Uh, no, I'll give you that. You can okay. choose that. <laughs> I guess would, that would be it. Okay, it would you know, have been a film like, thing, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I did, I, I love film and I, I think in college I made a film. Right, okay. What was that about? It was about, it was a surrealist film. It was about Patty Hearst. Okay. Cool. <laughs> I am um, talking of plumbers. I sometimes quite fantasize about being a plumber. It's not a great <laughs> fantasy to have, but that uh -huh. thing that you mentioned uh -huh. of just knowing uh, there's mm -hmm. no subjectivity to whether it's, yeah, you, you go and you fix the sink. You have mm -hmm. to fix a sink and you fix the sink. Right. And that's tick. You can tick that off as a done thing. Yeah. And I think that's something that, it sounds quite appealing. Um, there might be plumbers listening to this who are bored <laughs> sick of that. Yeah. But um, I under I can see what you mean by think by like oh that would actually be quite a novel. Nice if you've not been doing that for your whole life. That that's actually quite. I mean, I'm not saying I don't mean to take away from plumbers. Or I mean, I I just think that doing something concrete. Mm. But actually, you know, water and leaks is also incredibly mysterious as is electricity to me yeah <laughs> um but yeah just having something concrete to do uh you know whether you're a nurse or you know whatever and you leave your job at, and, and and you go home and you go home and but yeah. honestly like i wouldn't know what to do if i had nothing to think about yeah do you find yourself just working constantly on things pretty much do, yeah you kind of because you've got a studio at home. Do you have a... Do you have I have a studio outside of my home. Okay. Like, ju like just out... You have to go to the studio? Or yeah, I have like to it? go okay. to the oh, studio. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay, cool. But then when you get home, are you just... Are you good at just leaving that there and watching cheer? Or? Yeah, sure. Okay. I mean, I don't go... I'm not like an artist who goes to my studio nine to five or anything. It right. just depends on the project. And sure. I... But, I mean, as like... Not a conceptual artist, but to me, it's... I like to, you know, it starts with ideas. So you can do that anywhere or mm -hmm. you can, you know, write, write things or, you know, anywhere and, and just kind of looking around and observing and just thinking, taking things in. And to me, um, that's kind of fun. Yeah. <laughs> you can do anywhere. I don't know. Yeah, sure. Like I admire poets because your life is just a constant, um, you know, you can do it anywhere and you think about it. And Yeah. Poet has to be the most romantic of the arts, mm. I would say. My daughter's become a really good poet. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, great. It's kind of the forgotten art, a lot of people say, isn't it, poetry? It's funny, though. I think there are more living poets than there have ever been. Right. Poetry's never been bigger. 
Okay, it's coming back <laughs> in a big way. <laughs> How did you enjoy the book writing? Did you, did you enjoy mm. putting the book together? I mean, it's kind of one part torture. <laughs> sure. I mean, some parts I loved writing about and then other parts were hard to write about. And um, it was kind of daunting, but I had an editor who, it was almost like getting an assignment. Okay, write more about this, you know, and someone to nudge you along. So the bits that you didn't enjoy writing about for whatever reasons they were, were there ever, I'm guessing it's not an option to just be like, we're just not, I'm just not going to write that. I'm not going to put that in. Well, I mean, the, har the hardest thing actually to write about in a certain way was, um, well, one, how to integrate Sonic Youth into it, which is, was such a big part of my life. But I didn't want to write a book about Sonic Youth. Mm. I'm sure someday someone will write a good book about Sonic Youth. Um, and the other thing was um, how, to, how to talk about the art world and certain artists who are influential and you know, not knowing, is this going to be boring because no one knows this is not a public figure? And it's a lot of abstract ideas that are just really hard to put in a format that's um, kind of, a popular format, you know, right. memo I'm writing. Uh, that was the hardest thing. Um, and I had a book of essays that came out maybe the year before. And I, I wish that I could, they could have just been put together. <laughs> right. Now. Yeah. Do you think that's on the book front is, is th cause some people write, you know, three autobiographies that mm -hmm. book felt like it was all there and it doesn't mm -hmm. need to be anymore. But right. how, how do you, how, how do you feel about it? Would you write, not, ne not necessarily another mm -hmm. autobiography or mm -hmm. an extended one, but is there any other writing mm -hmm. that you particularly want to do? Yeah. I mean, I have, I have to get back to it, but um, there is some, something I started writing that was more, it kind of came out of uh, something I wrote for um, an art show. Um, and it was, really just an excuse to have a structure to write in. Right. And I've sort of extended it. I, I would like to finish it and just put it out more as like an art book or something and not promote it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like a no novel, noveletta or something. Yeah. Nice. Well, the, the book's amazing. The new record, it's not that new anymore, is it? It's an old record. It probably feels weird to still be like talking about that kind of thing. But, mm -hmm. um, they're both great. So uh, thanks for coming on the podcast. Oh, Cameron. thanks really a lot. Appreciate it. It's a pleasure. Anyway, good night.